a midweek special covering an issue that cannot wait until my next show on Sunday. On Wednesday, 31st of March, shielding rules for clinically vulnerable and clinically extremely vulnerable people end. There's no science to back this up. There's nothing being put in place to acknowledge the fact that people who have been sent letters by this government because they are known to be more at risk from COVID than the rest of the populace are not suddenly less so. It's another arbitrary target made in defiance of common sense, it seems. I've spoken recently to DPAC about long-term sick and disabled people on this show. I've spoken with Safe Ed for All about the issues connected with schools and many of those shielding our parents or children themselves. On this show, I've spoken with Excluded UK regarding people who have not been supported by this government and been let down. And here we are again with more people being let down. These shielders, many will now have to return to work and risk their health, return their children to school and risk their health or face fines or hardship if they don't. This is maddeningly avoidable and it's too important an issue to not get this show out ahead of that date. So with me tonight to discuss this, I'm very grateful for them joining me at relatively short notice, our representatives from Shield Us, a not-for-profit organization set up to offer support and raise awareness for the shielding community in response to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. Welcome Nina, Emmy and Ethan. Thank you for joining me tonight, folks. How are you all? We're doing Thank great. For Thanks for having us. Very welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, for those unaware of your organisation, unaware of your work, who are you? How did you come into being? And what got you guys involved? What are the aims of Shield Us? So um, I set this up, um, I started it in May last year because two of my children have a chronic lung disease. So in the first wave, they were um, asked to shield. Um, and, you know, the realisation that there was just a huge lack of awareness, support, education in the UK regarding, you know, chronic health conditions was you know, astounding to me. So we st I started, um, you know, we, we created a symbol that people could wear because many people as well that are shielding and, that ha and have chronic health conditions, a lot of them have invisible conditions. So you can't always tell when someone's, um, you know, at risk um, because they look healthy. Um, and, that, and that was a big th a thing for my family personally. My son said, well, I look fine. How does anybody know that I'm sick? So, you know, we started that way. Um, we supplied lots of NHS trusts with our with our products for their TV stuff, and then since then we've really grown. I mean, we have a, a we've have a huge team working with us now. We have therapists, counsellors, uh, social workers, uh, teachers, health advocates, um, you know, a whole community of people that are, and we're working really to support people that are shielding, um, anyone with a chronic illness in the UK, and to raise awareness because there is just so little. Yeah, thank you for that. What's, how did you uh, come into this, Emmy? <clears throat> I've, Sorry. Um, I've been um, a health advocate with rare disease and undiagnosed families for about 10 years now. And I am CEV myself and clinically extremely vulnerable. My son didn't make the shielding list and should have. And um, I found Shield Us on, on Twitter. And there was a big Shield Us movement on Twitter, a shielding movement, people looking for a place to get support. And I approached Nina, just seeing what could we do? How can I help? And from there, um, took, I kind of moved into running, I run the Northern Ireland side and um, help with the campaigns. Um, that was something we discovered um, when Shielding was paused around August that there's nothing coming support wise. They're just pausing Shielding and pretending this didn't happen and there's no support and no awareness. So from there, it turned from support to campaigning and raising awareness um, in a very big way. So that's how I came on board. Thank you, Emmy. And Ethan, what brought you into uh, the organisation? What's your story? So we are just, um, I have a special educational needs. Um, so we are, um, I discovered Facebook one day just from being on a press briefing and it really kind of opened my eyes at how um, there were so many that were afraid um, and so many that were kind of wanting those unanswered questions that weren't being asked. Um, and um, I remember just commenting and kind of just encouraging people to not give up and um, to keep going and um, to really kind of like, even though we're going through this hard time, to really just um, that we're, we're all in this together. And I remember then just um, coming into contact with Emma. Um, and um, Emmy kind of told me a bit more about Shield Us, told um, me the amazing work that they do. 
um, and I ended up with a mental health ambassador, which brings me to where I am today. And I couldn't be more than happy to be um, with such amazing um, support people. That's why I started. Fantastic! It's brilliant that uh, you, you know you get involved in one of these things, these these organisations uh, uh, such as these. I've, I've, as I said, I've interviewed a number of them now, and you get people that come in and they are you know their interest is peaked at the start, and they want to know what it's about, and they're seeing these uh, the support is being offered, and they get then get involved and they become more involved, and you take on a role and you know an, an ambassador role for the organisation is an absolutely uh, fantastic thing, and. Uh, yeah, fair play for you for doing that because I find this such a frustrating thing to have to cover. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous that we're in this boat. And Nina, I, you, you mentioned that you've got a lot of professionals have picked up on what you've what you've set up, what you've started, and that shows surely, obviously, to anybody looking in the uh, the the what the health professionals and health workers see and the value they see in your work, but also the need for it as well, because the government have completely ignored it. Um, so my wife is clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, we did make the decision to send our children to school. Um, being in West Cornwall, we've largely avoided the worst of the COVID crisis. However, I pulled them out just this week as a case of COVID was reported in the school and has since risen to four cases. Um, but come the end of this month, the school cannot extend the leave for my children due to my wife's needs because the government have decided those that it instructed to shield, that they sent a letter to, all of a sudden, none of them need to anymore. Is there some logic behind this that I've missed? Are they relying on the fact that now we have a, a vaccine that everyone, you know, a lot of people have had a single dose <laughs> of this double dose vaccine? Why are they doing this? Uh, is is there any reasoning or logic behind what they're doing, or are they just? Is it is it a completely arbitrary choice? Well, well, if there is logic, we no, no one has seen it or understands it because this has happened throughout. You know, shielding has been paused and stopped, and everyone's been told, right, off you go. You know, and then it's had to be brought back in again, and this is just happening over and over again. And you know, the mental health him, mental health impact this is having on people is just huge. Um, and as you say, you know, people receive this letter saying you must shield, continue to shield for three weeks after your second dose. Three weeks later, they're now being told, no, don't worry about that. There's no mention of shielding after the second dose. There's in fact no mention of vaccines in this 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 uh, second letter that everyone's received in England. So it's so contradictory and it has been the whole way through. It's so confusing for everybody. Yeah, for, for Northern Ireland, it actually states that it doesn't matter if you've even had one vaccine, you have to you, you can return to work. The, the, the caveat in Northern Ireland is there is a caveat that you must continue working from home unless you can't. But a, a huge number of working age CEV. You know, there's an absolutely huge number of working age CEV. 642,000 in England. Now, that was ONS from June 2020. We know that number's bigger. We know that number's far bigger. Working age, you know, is also parent age. Yeah. Which is something that's really being missed. Um, what's really, really difficult is, yes, we have the vaccines. Now, we, a few weeks ago, Matt Hancock was telling everybody to continue shielding after the second vaccine. Mm. And all of a sudden, I don't know what the rules are in England compared to the vaccine, because it, as it isn't actually mentioned, obviously, but it is mentioned in our advice in Northern Ireland. It doesn't matter if you've had one. Now, that's a huge concern. The other concern that nobody's talking about, and oh, there's no science, I don't understand this. New variants. We're talking about a booster in the autumn. Hmm. So, yes, we have the vaccine. We don't know the number of immunosuppressed in the UK. We don't have that number, and I wish we did. We're trying to find it desperately. Now, John Hopkins came out um, and said um, two weeks ago that they ran a study on tran for transplant patients in America. Um, it was 436 participants um, having one dose of the vaccine. Only 17% of that number had any detectable antibodies compared to people who are immunocompetent. So, you know, their immune systems are fine. 
that's a hundred percent. They have detect. They have some antibodies for immunosuppressed. It's a huge worry. I'm immunosuppressed. I'm on complex biological therapy. I'm incredibly immunosuppressed. Right now, I'm not medically well enough to actually have the vaccine. Yeah. That's the thing. There are so many. There's so many of them that are immunosuppressed yet. that fall into that category. And so many of these people just do not know if the vaccine is going to work for them. So, you know, after one dose being told that's it, go back to work. You know, they don't even know if it's had any effect. Um, and there is no antibody <clears throat> testing available for people. Um, there's nothing provided for these people that are immune suppressed because, you know, if they were able to access some sort of antibody test um, that then showed them they did have some protection, they would feel a bit more comfortable. But there's just nothing at all. No support and no, no protection. And nowhere to go for to ask how we do this, how do we find this out? People are paying privately, a lot of money privately, to be um, to have antibody testing. Yeah. But again, for parents, for them to say that it is safe for our children, for our CEV children, for our CEV families to be in the school population right now, it, there is no science behind that absolutely no science behind that there's clusters breaking out everywhere our whole school population in northern ireland isn't actually back yet to the 17th but our shielding is pretty much getting ended on the 12th so they're not even waiting to see what the impact of schools going back last week our cmo came out to the media and said there will be a spike in cases because schools are going back and then a few days later says right CV can go back to work and everybody back into schools and the problem for our CV families are we're not written into the guidelines the guidelines are completely open to interpretation so it comes down to your relationship with schools I know some schools who are incredible and have been throughout not just providing education for the children and their family you know they've actually been doing weekly phone-ins you know access to the teachers at any time of day they've been incredible and in other schools are putting parents through hell with fines and off rolling and being thrown into a homeschool situation is difficult but some parents are literally having to do it on that day that's it i've got to been told off roll or i'm being fined all of a sudden, they've got to create a whole homeschool package for the children. The stress of it is just absolutely, it's, it's immense. Yeah. And again, no package of support. There's nothing. No, and a lot of people have taken the choice to, to actually withdraw their children yeah. from schools as well in order to protect them and protect themselves from the fines. Of course, then they have this issue of uh, educating their children themselves, which is difficult on top of all the other responsibilities that they may have. And... As you said, there's no additional support to help these people to do that. It's 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 dire, but people are being felt they've felt that they they're left with no option but to do that to protect their own health. Absolutely, and, and it's it's absolutely shameful. The other the other side of this is that the the government have done nothing to improve the safety of school environments either. They have they've not prioritised school staff for vaccination, for example. They've not improved ventilation. Kids are in bubbles of literally hundreds, entire yes. year groups, which is crazy. Uh, there are still as many students in a classroom as there ever were before. Schools are no safer now than they were before the first or second lockdown. You just, and you, know, you alluded to, you know, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. They've alluded to a spike. Well, you know, a spike is a pretty good guess, given that we've been through this three times now. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. I spoke some weeks ago to a member of Independent Sage. I had Dr. Gabriel Scally on my show who highlighted the fact that there is no approved vaccine right now for those under the age of 18. Um, there are, of course, many children who are themselves CV or CEV. Um, Dr. Kailash Chand, uh, one of my colleagues at Socialist Telly and uh, former deputy chair of the BMA, he um, brought up the fact that we have no idea really what the effect on transmissibility is with regards to these vaccines. There are so many unknowns and there's so many holes in the government legislation, as you say, it's completely open to interpretation. Um, you know, children uh, who are vulnerable themselves, have the government offered any exceptions for them or have their shielding issues evaporated as well at their say so? Yeah, basically, so CEV children um, are told in England to go back to school, you know, from the 1st of April yeah. as well. Um, you know, that's, crazy it's really tough it's really tough for the children as well you know these children are you know 
they're really scared. They're already suffering, you know, chronic health conditions themselves. Their parents are really anxious. They're being told that their child has another threat to life, potentially. Um, yeah. And, you know, there is so much that the government could do. We're speaking with uh, no isolation at the moment, and they provide AV1 robots. Um, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're incredible. And they are for chronically ill children who miss a lot of time off school. Mm. Um, 72,000 children a year miss long periods of school because they're chronically ill. These have, they have their robots that they use and they, the children can still speak to their teacher. They can put their hand up. They can be carried around the school. They can go to sleepovers. There's, you know, no safeguarding issues. They're amazing. And they're used in 400 councils at the moment in the UK are providing them. But we're trying to work with them so that every council funds these and can provide them to families with CV children mm. because then they still have the social interaction with their friends at school. They're still in the classroom. It's, you know, they're still- They part. get their attendance. And they get the attendance, yeah, the <laughs> attendance, it's marked, they were t- marked as attendant, attending, and, um, you know, it takes the pressure off the parents having to homeschool as well, mm. and there's just no reason that remote learning shouldn't be continued for these children. Some of them are life-limiting, you know, life-limiting illnesses, and yeah. then they have to go back to school, it's, it's crazy. I've spoke to life, I've spoke to parents of um, life-limited children, and they've got a really good point. Um, said my child he um, he would he should be on the shielding list but isn't now again it's this insult to intelligence which is something else I'm hearing a lot over the past couple of weeks since all all the changes have started being announced is the insult to our intelligence we know our own health we know what a flu does to us we know what a cold does to us our children know what a winter is like if you've got a clinically vulnerable child winter some what we're hearing is for a lot of our um, CV children they're actually having the best you know that their health's the best it's ever been because they're out of the school population not coming into the colds the flus the chicken pox you know mm. you know the noroviruses and things like that that's a huge concern for them as well going back the other thing that's really really big with this for life limited families is the risk of shortening their, their children's short lives yes mm. thankfully our children you know the, the mortality isn't so high but it's the the, the risk the risk of long covid for a start for any child you know there's there's what nearly eighty thousand on ons data so again it's going to be underestimated mm. eighty thousand, nina um it's eighty thousand kids in the uk with with long covid so yeah. far so far if you're, you've got a child who's life limited, you don't want to be risking a disease, oh, a con- you know, a virus they've never been in contact with. And risk, the, the parents are saying we don't want them to risk shortening their already short lives. It's absolutely heartbreaking speaking to these parents. Some schools are incredible and allowing them to stay home, allowing the siblings to stay home and allowing the whole family to bubble and have been there and been there every step of the way. Not every school, because again, the guidelines, the guidelines, the guidelines, they are just so open to interpretation. It's heartbreaking the stories that we're hearing right now. And also, how do you explain to a child that you've been telling for a year that you are extremely vulnerable, you cannot see anybody, you cannot go to school, and then to suddenly say, right, back to school, you're fine. And they're going to say, well, is the virus gone then? Is it safe for me now? They're going to be so confused, so anxious. And there's no mental health support for these children at no. all. There's no support for them um, or for their siblings or for their parents. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my son's terrified of bringing COVID home. Absolutely petrified. The amount of young carers. That's another thing that's not being talked about. Siblings. The healthy child in the house, whether it be the parent or or a sibling, they know their parent or their sibling. They know that CEV person's health inside out because they live with it every single day. They have an insight because of living with somebody who's CEV. For them to go out the door every morning to an unsafe school environment, they know it's unsafe and panic and worry about bringing COVID home to that clinically vulnerable relative is enormous. It's horrible, horrible. But again, no support, no mental health support for these children, no plan 
for these children who are going to be going back to school? Where's the, where's the money being spent? Right now it's being spent on assumption. Any support that's going in because they haven't spoke to any of us. They haven't spoke to any of our clinically vulnerable to see exactly what we actually need. No. And that's a huge problem. If you're not going to communicate with the people affected, then you're not going to know. Absolutely. Are. And there's never any communication. It's always It always seems to be diktat that gets handed down. I must admit, the, uh, the side of life-limited children is not one that had crossed my mind. And I'm absolutely oh. appalled hearing what you've, you've told me. Uh, I mean, you, you, you know, as the parents, you know you, you, you're only going to have a finite amount of time with these children. You know as a parent, and it's the worst thing I can imagine as a, as a parent, that you know you're going to outlive your child. And to have this on top, without help, without assistance, without advice, uh, without uh, you know, mitigating circumstances and having you know, that additional help given to you to, to support you when you're already going through the worst thing imaginable and you're told that your, your child is, is fine and the virus is not going to affect them and the school environment is fine and they don't need a shield anymore. And that is absolutely cruel. It's absolutely reprehensible. I cannot oh. believe we're run by a, a government that, that chooses to do this with families of children so, so, Ill. And the other thing that's occurred to me since, since you mentioned it is a lot of these children will attend an additional needs school. And we know from statistics that have come out that actually cases of COVID amongst school staff have been far and away higher, I think seven times higher than they have been in mainstream schools within these additional needs settings. So they're in these settings, on, on, on the face of it, they're even more likely to come into contact with COVID, which is absolutely appalling. Um, Mental health with uh, with children, as, as you've mentioned before, as well. I can relate to this. My son, Logan, he, um, he has struggled with the whole lockdown side of things. He has struggled with the whole idea of even leaving the house, let alone going to school, for fear that he could come into contact with somebody and bring it home to mum and make her ill. Now, my children are older, so they, they get the the situation younger children i'm sure as you, as you said nina will be confused by this is it gonna you know is the virus gone now is it not gone but he's been absolutely terrified of it and we've had to go to the gp we've had to seek uh help for him because he's struggled so much with it um he's had suicidal thoughts uh he hasn't dreamt of actually doing anything about it but it's been there and he's 16 mm -hmm. so you know it, it's it's a horrible situation that is being put on the children as much as fear of being instilled into parents at the thought of sending their children back to school. Um, it's just such a, it's so maddening. It's just so, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm the interviewer here. I'm struggling to find the words right now to try and put this in a way that can be broadcastable, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, it's just unfundamentally, cruel and ignorant and Absolutely. uncaring and there's no rhyme or reason for them to do what they're doing when jenny harris came out and said at, um at one of the press briefings about hugging granny maybe just once because we don't actually have the data to say the vaccines work for clinically extremely vulnerable i think that tells the tale yeah 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 i couldn't agree more now i've got to move beyond the school issue there is the matter of the workplace as well now for those furloughed on 80 percent of their wages there may be a, a keen desire to return back to work to get back to their full wage packet the 80 percent figure was again an arbitrary figure a miserly choice when the government could have supported people with what they were used to earning and for all the government knew needed to earn to make ends meet especially when wages these days are so so often so low and this will include cv and cev workers too what I find particularly galling is that although they're lifting the shielding requirements, the government are still urging people to take precautions. How? With what support? What can they do when they're told they can't shield anymore, but you, you've still got to be careful? You know, you're a brickie, you're a, a welder. Please work from home. How's that going to work? 
You know, it's it, it's bizarre. What pressure are shielders that you've spoken to feeling right now? What is the opinion? And have any workplaces you know of supported shielding employees in any meaningful way when our government clearly doesn't? A few have. Um, we have, you know, some people that are really happy to go back to work. You know, we're not going to lie, shielding is really tough. It's not an easy thing to do. So there are people that have been shielding that are happy to go back to work. They feel safe in the place that they're going back to work and they feel like their employers have done what they need to do for them to to feel able to go back but um overwhelmingly no there isn't any support the guidance is again open to interpretation your workplace must be covid secure what's covid secure because there isn't really any any more to it than that so you know if you don't feel that your workplace is covid secure as a cev person you have you have no support and no choice you you go back or you don't go back you go back or you don't have a job so it's it's really tough yeah uh, Ethan, can I bring you in on this point? What do you uh, you, you you make of this uh, issue with the workplaces? What's your experience been? Yeah, it's it's been quite um, difficult because I've been out um, of um, a job since um, I'd say maybe Christmas two years ago. Um, I'd say it was probably last time I um, had a job, um, and I went for a few interviews. Um, through kind of lockdown um, and through kind of the um, period of um, kind of still with COVID. Um, and it was more or less you were told, oh, that this is what we're, we're kind of expectation set out. Um, if you don't hear from us, basically you haven't got it. And um, really it was kind of a quick two-minute kind of interview um, very quick in and out, but in the same way, it was um, just the anxiety and the worry um, of um, being a student myself. Um, I've just recently um, finished my diploma and uh, for a level three, and I remember when it hit March when coronavirus first started, um, we were sent work from home. Um, and the pressure and trying the same way from when to look for a job and to try and um, gain that wee bit of extra money and experience, it just wasn't happening. And um, employers were kind of, um, some, some were appreciative and some it was just, yep, yeah, um, we can only um, hire so many, try again in a few months or whatever. And it, yeah, the work, the work, there's, a, there's very, very few jobs available as well yeah you're right the, the interview process the whole the whole the whole system's changed what i find really really difficult um independent sage put out these figures um i think it was three weeks ago so we are told um if our workplace is unsafe to contact the health and safety executive go through Oc health um so um, these numbers were given out it was i can't find i can't remember the study it came from so there's been 134,000 complaints about unsafe workplaces since the start of this pandemic. According to Indy Sage, not one has been investigated. It gets better, worse. Um, so the Health and um, Safety Executive since 2010 has been slashed by 58%. For sake. 36% of inspectors have been lost. And on average, a workplace can now be expected to be inspected once every 275 years. Good. Where are we meant to go? It's clinically extremely vulnerable. We have useless guidelines. We have employers begging right now for, for, for more advice. How do we keep our employees safe? 275 years you can expect to have an inspector in your workplace. That is ridiculous. Where are we meant to go? That How is, is this meant to ridiculous. happen? It makes me so mad. It's not, yeah. I, really, I can't remember the last time I got, mm, felt like this on an interview. Because ugh, when, when you have so much money being spent by this government on things that don't work, and yet they're not spending any money or any investment in things that are needed... And still, people see this government as the as the the party you of know, the Conservatives as the party of fiscal responsibility and uh, being responsible with the economy. It's, who is the economy working for right now? 
because it's clearly not for ordinary people. It's working no. for people who were given track and trace contracts, for example. This is absolutely ma maddening. This is so frustratingly avoidable and so irresponsible. It's massively irresponsible spending that they're doing. They're not applying the spending where it's needed. And in a minute, they'll say, oh, but we've all got to pay it back in a moment. And let's not forget the effect that Brexit has actually had on all of this as well, because that gave that, that's been a nearly a 10 percent shock to the economy and um, you know, unemployment has gone through the roof. And clearly where you know, employers are going to be looking for employees that are not hopefully going to get sick on their on their book, they're not going to be looking. You know, no. they, it's going to be discriminatory along the lines as well. It really is going to be. And we've, I mean, since the announcement of Sheldon um, being scrapped, we we know people who were literally sacked overnight because they were CEV. Mm. Now, what, what's really, really frustrating is um, a lot of people who are CEV could not access furlough because they were CEV. So in the same employment, so in the same job, the person they maybe sat next to in the office was furloughed. But because they were clinically extremely vulnerable, they had to claim SSP. SSP has run out for a lot of people. Yeah, You're now on to ESA. Now, here in Northern Ireland, I don't know, um, there hasn't been very much in England about, you know, the, what happens. Here in Northern Ireland, from the 12th of April, our CEV are not entitled to SSP or ESA because they're clinically extremely vulnerable. We're not entitled to it because CEV is not a thing anymore. Now, you can remove the term all you want, it but it does not that. remove the risk. It's still We're still in the same situation here. There's new variants. We don't have the data for the vaccines. The boosters aren't looking until, you know, autumn time. Yeah. Well, of course, here in England, you can't claim ESA anymore. It's, it's straight on to universal credit. ESA is a legacy benefit that you cannot claim anymore um, it, unless you've already been claiming it. Well... We're, we've now well, now we're, now we're not entitled to ESA here in Northern Ireland. It is universal credit universal now. Credit, yeah, sure. Uh, and that's that's uh, as I covered a few weeks ago with Deepak. It's an absolute mess of a system. It's a vile system. Doesn't it, that, it's that, that, really doesn't work in Northern Ireland? It's just right. penny pinching nastiness from a government that just doesn't want to support people anymore. Um, oh, let's let's. <laughs> move on to something that's slightly less or oh, you have a new campaign out let's go with that one um oh, Nina. Don't forget about us we do so, yeah, talk so, a little bit about this and how people might get involved with it because if yes. they're as angry as i'm feeling right now they might well want to yeah so don't forget about us is you know including all the people that are for life that life isn't going to go back to normal straight you know as quickly as as everyone else perhaps um you know the cv children that can't have a vaccine where does that leave them um people that are immune suppressed does the vaccine work for them people that can't have the vaccine and at the moment like any who's not who's not medically well enough to have it you know so this is a large group of people this is hundreds of thousands of people that are still you know at as much as at as much risk as they have been you know the risk hasn't changed for them they don't have access to a vaccine they don't know if the vaccine works for them um you know and we can't forget that these people you know what's going to happen with them are these children going to have to go back to school they're going to have to mix with everyone or are they you know or some of them are lucky enough that they are given the support to stay at home but how long are they going to have to stay at home for they're going to have to stay at home you know for years and years and years and not see anybody it's, it's so difficult for these people. We need to raise awareness of this and these people need support. And we need to know what's going to happen for these people that are immune suppressed if the vaccine doesn't work. Is there going to be something in place? Is there something in place for people that can't have the vaccine because of their health condition? You know, what's, what's going to happen to one of these people and how, and how are we going to support them? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, as is a final point, um, we do have people uh, in positions of power that watch this show, watch our shows on Socialist Telly. Uh, numerous figures from uh, both main parties uh, tune in. Right now, is there anything you would like to say to these these people in power to help your situation, to raise awareness? What do you want them to do? Talk to us. Communicate with us. All we have heard from people we are supporting is we are forgotten. 
we've been we're at home we don't know what's happening the me- the ch- messages change we're literally refreshing websites daily to find out what our lives are going to look like talk to us communicate with us and realize that our lives can't just go back to normal because you have decided so show us the science if you have it show us the science Share it with us. Reassure us if that's the case. Help employers support their clinically vulnerable. This is huge. Unemployment is already a problem. The amount of people that cannot go back to their jobs, cannot go back into public facing roles. What's happening with the vaccines? Where's the data? And schools, please, please help our clinically vulnerable children. They can't have the vaccine. They can't access it. Not all children are under consultant care and not all consultants are happy to make the decision for the child to have the vaccine because it's not licensed. Our schools need firm guidance. Give the schools what they need to support our clinically vulnerable children. Give the schools what they need to support our clinically vulnerable parents put mitigations in school that make them COVID safe, ventilation first and foremost. And don't don't insult our intelligence. We know our own health. That's what we need. We need a conversation. We've got people begging to talk to you. <laughs> talk, sit down and have a conversation. That's what's needed. Thank you very much for that, Emmy. That's a very difficult uh, thing to follow on from. I would ur- strongly urge anyone from the uh, Conservative Party or Labour Party who are watching this to take this lady up on her offer, to take Shield Us up on this offer, because they need help and they need to be listened to, and people clearly aren't. And people's health and lives are at stake with this. Shield Us, thank you so much for joining me and discussing yet another very difficult uh, subject, the horrendous actions by this government during this pandemic, a pandemic they continue to mishandle and continues to go on and on. Um, I hope if you've been watching this and you're as angry as I am, frankly, I must admit this has been one of the most uh, difficult interviews I've done in order to keep my own cool, um, as angry as I am, that the most vulnerable in society continue to be the most put upon, even to the point their lives are put at risk. You can keep up to date with the goings on on the campaigning of Shield Us on their webpage, shieldus.org.uk. You can even buy some of their merchandise, I believe, to help fund their work. You can also follow them on Twitter at Shield Us One, and they're also on Facebook too. Have I missed any, guys? No, I think that's it. That's great. That's great. Brilliant. Guys, thank you so much for joining me to talk about this tonight. Thank you so much for the work that you are doing. I sincerely hope the government have a change of heart over this, but it's good to know this issue is being fought and being challenged, and more people need to be aware of it and to join in that fight. And 